Let's give the Lord praise. You know, we have a special, special treat today. Uh, and no one is more excited than me. <laughs> because I get a break this Sunday. And he's always a precious brother. We go way back, all the way back to uh, Bible college. And uh, he actually knew my wife. He lived in the same neighborhood when they were kids. So he's always been part of the family, even, even when we didn't know it. <laughs> he was already there. Um, you know him as Chung Man Kim. I know him as DK. Uh, we have uh, been brothers since the beginning. He's been always an encouragement to me, and uh, we, we keep in touch even though we might be miles apart. We always make a, make a habit of just reaching out to one another, seeing how we're doing, praying for one another, and uh, we're bros for life. Amen? Amen. And uh, it's funny because on my desk, I have a cornerstone picture that uh, Paula or Joshi made, and it's on my desk. And right next to it is a picture of DK. And it's funny because the other day, you know, my wife and my daughter, they love K-pop. <laughs> they love BTS and, and these other bands. And uh, they, 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 they have pictures of these Korean pop stars, right? And then Leonie goes, oh, do you want to put this picture on your desk? She knows how I feel about that. I, I don't like putting K-pop anywhere near my desk. Anyway, near my vicinity. And I say, no, I already have my K-pop star. And I said, look, it's a picture of Chu Man <laughs> I said, I got the best K-pop star. So without further ado, I would like to welcome up my brother in Christ, Chu Man Kim, my Korean, my favorite Korean in the world, Daniel Kim. <laughs> Giving you to encourage this church. You guys got that? Just one word. If I come up to you, give you the mic. Because we need to encourage each other, y'all. And that's what I love about the cornerstone. Can we turn up the beat a little bit? Let's go. Come on. Yeah. If you don't know what to do, just go like this. Just pretend you're like that cat in that Chinese restaurant. You ready? Because we're bringing heaven down. You feel me? Heaven down. All right. If I come up to you, you're just going to give one word. We're going to start off with Caleb. Ready? Go. One word, bro, just one word. Yo, blessings. Yo, let's give more blessings because we need the message to be blessed. I must confess, I am a sinner, but he is the savior. His warm love, it changed my behavior. Yes, we're here in the cornerstone. Yo, when I know that I'm not here on my own, yeah. Cause he gave me this message to give you. I know it's tough, but I know you can get through. Yeah, oh. Uh. You guys ready? Yo, let's go. It's okay because we're holding our own. Abide. Jesus said, I am the vine and we are the branches. Yeah. Let's believe that so we can prepare for all these avalanches. Yeah, again, let me say that again. Yeah, we go against the current of the trend. We're all friends. He said, I am the vine. You are the branches. So we're prepared for the avalanches. We cannot be stopped. We're just like time. Yeah. Uh, I hope you feel this. Yo, I hope you remember why you exist, yeah. I'm messing with this mask, so I'm gonna take it off. Cause I'm gonna be who I really am, yeah. And that's who he really is. He is the one that said, I am who I am. Uh, when I say corner, you say stone. Corner, corner, yeah, corner, corner, yeah. All is lost without the cross. And may we save and seek this loss just like him. Yo, I know that I used to be fat, but now I'm thin. Uh -huh. Yeah, because he changed me. And this is the way that he's gonna arrange us. Yo, it's only him that we trust. So let's escape the money, blood, and the lust. Yeah, uh, you ready? Oh, yeah. Oh, what a beautiful word. Humans of planet Earth, that spells hope. Yo, let me get my intentions and put it on a rope that I may die and that he may live. I'm just grateful for Christ because he always forgives. Uh, what is the word? It says hope. What is the word, everybody? It says hope. Jesus is hope. You're the humans of planet Earth. Yo, I'm just fragile and I'm made from dirt. But 
the water and made me a son and a daughter of the Most High. And this is why I will abide. I'm grateful to be in this place. Yeah, I'm grateful for the one and only grace. Yeah, I'm thankful for true blessing. Simply amazing. My heart is blazing. Yeah, we're going to give hope to the people that's lost. And we're going to tell them about the beautiful boss, the beautiful, omnipotent, sufficient savior. I told you before, his love, it changed my behavior. Yeah, so let's come one together and understand that we're going to live forever. When I say corner, you say stone. Corner. Stone. Corner. Stone. Know that you're not alone. Woo. Yeah. All right, y'all. You guys can chill. Sit down. If I don't, you guys can't see me. <laughs> Woo! All right, here we go. You good? We got the slides. All right, here we go. All right, so uh, representing Divine Kingdom. Um, here we go, Cornerstone. All right, when, when you guys see this logo, you say Divine Kingdom. When you see this, you say Cornerstone. You guys ready? Yeah. Divine right. Kingdom. All right, let's try that again. Kingdom. All right, this one. All right, all right, all right, here we go. Divine Kingdom. All right, repeat after me. Divine kingdom. Divine kingdom. All right, now, corner kingdom. <laughs> you guys remember this? You guys remember this? Or divine stone. <laughs> divine stone. I think we voted. All right, who votes for corner kingdom? Everybody make some noise. Corner kingdom. Corner kingdom? Yeah. All right, hold on. Divine stone. Yeah. That sounds exactly the same. All right, so just a little bit of review. We're talking about the four fundamentals. The four what? Fundamentals. All right, the reason why this is so important, I actually used to be a basketball coach, and I had to teach the four fundamentals of basketball. And I'm using that as an analogy because there's also four fundamentals of the church in Acts 2.42. And today we're going to go over the second and the third fundamental. All right, so in Acts 2.42, we know that the four fundamentals of the church are the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And it's always important to go back to the fundamentals, whether you're a physician or you're an athlete or you're a member of the church, we need to go back to the fundamentals. And so, again, the four fundamentals or the four devotions of the church are the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and what is it? Prayer, let's go. So we talked a little bit about the apostles' teaching. This was years ago. And we shared about why doctrine is so important to know. Why it's so important for each and one of us to read the scriptures on our own so we know what the truth is. Also, fellowship. It's so amazing that we could have fellowship here today and have this living church the experience as brothers and sisters Christ. Also, breaking of bread, there are two meetings to breaking of bread. One is that they ate together, the early church ate together, and also they had communion with each other. So first of all, let's talk about fellowship. All right, so who loves fogs? You guys love fogs? I grew up with like, hey, don't be a fog. Do you guys still talk like that? Do kids say that? Do you guys say that? Like, you're a fog, like whatever. Because I, I came to America when I was three years old, and then I didn't know how to speak English that well. English is my second language. And then if you pronounce things differently, you know, like, you're a fob, right? All right, I'm going to teach you guys some silly Korean, because I know some of you guys are like Korean K-pop fans. All right, so we used to say, because, you know, I grew up like in a Korean church. Um, you know, fobs is fresh off the boat, but in Korean, uh, P oh, thank you, right on. Piengi is plain, all right? Piengi. Can you guys say Piengi? Piengi. So if you're like, you're a fob, you're fresh off the Piengi. You guys get it? It's like you're fresh off the plane, all right? So that's what we used to say to each other. But fobs is fellowship of believers. Isn't that cool? All right. All right, fellowship of believers. So when someone calls you a fob, you're like, yeah, thank you. I'm a fellowship of the believers. In your face. I'm a fob. That's right. I'm proud of it. I'm a fellowship with the believers. So in Acts 2.42, the word of God says this. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. Verse 43. And awe came upon every soul. 
and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. It's incredible. Verse 44, the word of God says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 45, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Verse 46, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Verse 47, the word of God says, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. This is the word of the Lord in Acts 2, verses 42 to 47. So fellowship is the word koinonia. This is in the Greek. Greek looks so beautiful. And koinonia means to share. Everybody say share. Share. Participate. Participate. Contribute. Contribute. And have in common. <laughs> he, he's an old school rapper. I think he's Muslim, so we got to pray for common. You know, come to the Lord in Christ. But it's have in common. All right, this is very important. Sharing, participating, contributing, and having in common the ministry of Jesus. We're taking part in the fellowship of the ministry of Jesus. Jesus' ministry was threefold. It was preaching, it was teaching, and it was healing. Preaching for the soul, teaching for the mind, and healing for the body. You can say that it was preaching for reconciliation of our souls, you could say teaching for the reconstruction of our minds and healing for the restoration of the body. And when we partake in the fellowship of Jesus, together we are agreeing. We're going to share, we're going to participate, we're going to contribute and have in common this ministry that Jesus first led and we are following. And just as a reminder, a quick history lesson, this is the 12 disciples of Jesus. I'm not going to read all of them, but you guys could look up. How did the disciples of Jesus live? All right, first of all, Matthew, he was impaled by spears in Ethiopia. James, he was thrown off a wall, then clubbed to death. Jude was crucified in Persia. The apostle John, Jesus' best friend, he was exiled on an island called Patmos. That's right, Mom Bell, you get extra credit in heaven. Here we go. <laughs> so, um, it's just a reminder that Jesus has called us to live a life of sacrifice and to live a life of suffering. Partaking in the ministry of the fellowship is a life of suffering and sacrifice. And I wanted to encourage you guys to identify what is your role in the church. Everybody has a spiritual gift. This is a spiritual gift cheat sheet. I actually brought this for you. Hold on. I need a volunteer. Where's my, where's my boy Alex at? Where's Alex? Alex, come up here. Oh, you want to be a volunteer? Oh, come on, just hurry up. Here, this will be really fun. All right, this is what I did uh, when I taught high school. All right. So you just get this, right? And you just throw it in the middle. Okay? Go, go like in the middle and just throw it. Okay, everybody, you have to get up and grab them. Go, go right in the middle and just throw it in the air. Ready? Go in the middle. Go in the middle. Ready? Go, throw it in the air. Nice can. All right, everybody, grab a club. We got to be interactive. When, when the body moves, the brain grooves. Come on. All right, you guys got to move around. Come on, guys. This is uh, the church has got to move. You got to move with the spiritual gifts. All right, so, man, if you guys have a pen uh, or something to write with, or even on your phones you want to take notes, I just want to make two uh, challenges for every single individual in the church. And I want you guys to write this word. Put pray, ask, and try on that sheet I just gave you. If you don't have a pen or a pencil, it's okay. Maybe you could write it on your notes. On this sheet, on the top, just put pray, ask, and try. You know, for fun, it's Pat, right? Like, I don't know if you guys have a friend named Pat. Um, and pray and ask God, God, what are the spiritual gifts you have given me? How do you want me to use these gifts for the church? 
Um, and also ask. Ask your, your pastors, ask your friends, your mentors, and ask them, what spiritual gifts do you think I have? What do you think I'm good at? And also, number three, try. Maybe you have some spiritual gifts that you don't know of, and you, you just don't know because you haven't tried. So first of all, on this sheet, I want you to write PAP. Pray, ask, and try. Every single individual of the church, they have a role, and they have a position. Remember, I told you guys, I was a basketball coach. So we have positions. We have point guard, we have shooting guard, we have small forward, power forward, and center. And even the people on the bench, they have positions. You know, they're like left bench, right bench, you know, middle of the bench. You got assistant coach, coach, water boy. Everybody has a role. And how you figure out your position is you figure out what's your spiritual gift, and you start serving. You start serving, and you activate that gift. And I want to encourage you guys to take this sheet and pray, ask, and try. And also, 3D. How do we make our spiritual gifts 3D? Number one, everybody say, discover. discover. Number two, develop. develop. Number three, say, distribute. distribute. All right, we don't want to be spiritual midgets, okay? When I was a little kid, that was one of the things kids always said. They're like, oh, you're just a little midget, right? And then I read in the Bible, God will use the lowly. I was like, yeah! I was like, yes! God uses hobbits, woohoo! Right? I was so empowered by that. God will use the lowly. God will use the humble and ashamed the proud. I was like, yeah, God's going to use short people. All right? And what do I mean by uh, don't be a spiritual midget or, I guess, a spiritual little person? I don't know what to say that is the politically correct term. But there's so many people in the church, when I ask them, I say, are you a disciple of Christ? Or if I say, are you a Christian? Are you a believer? The first question, usually, if it's at a church, they'll say, what? Yes. And then I'll, I'll follow up. What are your spiritual gifts? And I follow up with that question, and you'll be blown away. Majority of the time when I ask that, what do you think the answer is? I don't know. They say, I don't know. And I remember uh, years ago, I, I came to Cornerstone, and I asked uh, Jason Banks, I was like, hey, Jason, what, what sport do you play? He's like, football. And I honestly forgot what position he played, but he said his position right away. He knew his position. He was like, I play football, and let's just say he said, I'm a lineman. And he knew it right away. What if um, I asked you, hey, are you a basketball player? And you're like, yeah, I'm a basketball player. I'm a baller, right? And I go, hey, what position do you play? I, I don't know. Or like, oh, you play football? Like you're, he's like, yeah, I'm a football player. But like, what, what, what position do you play? And they go, uh, I don't know. Like, are you sure you play football? Are you even on the team? Are you sure? And that is the analogy I want to give you in the church, that every single member of the church, they should say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And yes, this is my position. Amen. My position, like Larry the lineman right here, Larry's like, I, I, I love the conversation I had with Larry. He's like, I'm like a lineman. I see a gap, and I feel it. Boom, let's go. Let's give it up for Larry the lineman. And um, I gave your credit in front of everybody, so sorry, I took it away from heaven. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that is an example of the church. Every single person, we have a responsibility to activate our spiritual gifts. So, again, this is so important. And I wanted to share this. Um, for these times, especially during this time of pandemic and COVID. So, Revelation 21, 1, the Apostle John wrote this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Who likes the ocean? Anybody like the ocean? I love the ocean. I listen to ocean sounds all day. <laughs> Does anybody do that? You guys listen to like ocean sounds? Not like you guys don't do that? Because you know, we can't afford to like go to those beautiful places. We're like on YouTube. I'm like, yeah, I live in an oceanfront property. Sometimes I put it on like the speaker. It's like whoosh, whoosh. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> and I I was very disturbed when I first read this, because for some weird reason, when I imagined heaven, I thought it was gonna be like a beautiful oceanfront property. <laughs> I don't know if you guys ever thought about it that way. And I was like, what? Sea? How come there's no sea? 
I love the ocean. I love waterfalls. I love rivers. I love water of all kinds. How come there's no sea? And then I started doing some research on why does John say there is no sea? And again, going back to Mama Bell, where did John die? What, what island was it? The island of Patmos. He was on an island because they tried to kill John and he wouldn't die. So they put him on an island and on that island, he's surrounded by what? He's surrounded by the water. He's surrounded by the sea and the sea water. Amen. <laughs> and he's surrounded by the sea and that symbolized separation. Separation from everybody that he loved. So John... Some commentators and scholars, they believe John's writing, there is no sea, because what he's trying to say, in heaven, there's going to be no more separation Amen. from the people Amen. that I love Amen. so much. And I want to encourage you guys, that's what's the difficulty of being in these times. People feel separated. People feel separated like we're, we're just islands. But there is going to come a day where we'll never be separated. Amen. Never be separated from God and from the people of God. And I want to encourage you guys, you know, to be like a John. You know, Jesus, he had deep fellowship with his brothers as they, they preached and they taught and they healed others. And so it's a reminder of how they broke bread and they ate together and they had communion together. And this is what the cornerstone is all about as well. Verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread. So what I want to encourage you guys is the apostles' teaching, it means that we are a learning church. Everybody say, we're a learning church. Learning. Look to your neighbor and go, we're a learning church. Learning. Hey, look to your neighbor and be like, why aren't you taking notes, homie? <laughs> oh, come on. Like, where are your notes, right? We're a learning church. Everyone should have a journal, have a pen. If you don't have one, I got you. Walmart, 50 cents, what's up, right? <laughs> journal, pen. I'm serious, I will buy you one, right? <laughs> Always, when, when the word of God is being taught, bring a journal, bring a pen, take notes. We are a learning church. Also, fellowship, everybody say, we're a living church. We're a living church. We're a living church. I'm so grateful. My wife was telling me about how she was reading in Psalms, and... Um, she was reading in the book of Psalms about how when people put their heart and their mind into the things of the world, like false idols, like money, power, or lust, these things, they become like those idols that are dead. And they ref we reflect what we worship. And, and what she said, those people, they become lifeless and useless. Oh. But we as the believers in Christ... We are full of life, and we are useful for the kingdom. Amen? We are full of life, and we are useful. Let's be full of life and be useful for the kingdom of God because we follow a living God. We follow a living God, not these dead idols. Also, breaking of bread. Breaking of bread symbolizes that we're a loving church. Look to your neighbor and say, we're a loving church. Loving say, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to feed your stomach. Say that. And I'm going to feed your soul. Breaking of bread is all about feeding the stomach, but also feeding the soul. We're a loving church. So LLL. Ready? Everybody say learning. learning. Living. 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 Loving. Loving. All right. Let's check, do that again. Ready? Learning. learning. Living. 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 Loving. 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 Amen. 1 Timothy 4.16 said this. This is referring to the apostles' teaching and our doctrines. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So he's reminding his disciple, the apostle Paul, watch your life, how you live your life, and watch your teaching. Read the word of God. Ezra 7.10 says that Ezra sought out to study the Word of God, to practice the Word of God, and teach others the Word of God. And that is our life calling as well. This is um, a documentary that's called The American Gospel. And it's talking about the corruption of false teaching that is rampant in America. And I encourage you guys to watch it, to be aware 
of the false teaching. And if you know the truth, if you know the word, it is very obvious to you what is false and what is true. I want to encourage you guys to check that out. So verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. So this implies that the being devoted to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, this equals breaking of bread and praying. That means a healthy, thriving church, they are a studying church, they're a learning church, they're alive in fellowship, they're a living church, and they're a loving church with breaking of bread and prayer. But this, these are the activities. This is the natural outflow. When we're saved by grace through faith, we will naturally outflow these activities. The apostles' teaching, though you'll just be surrounded with people like digging in the word, like, what did you learn? Teach me what you learned. I want to know this. And they also want to be in fellowship. And also they want to break bread together. And they want to pray together. These are the four fundamentals. And I want to use a quick analogy, okay? So I've also been in the youth ministry uh, over 15 years, and I've also been a basketball coach. So when I went to basketball camps, uh, we would train with the four, what is it? Fundamentals. Fundamentals. We would do defensive drills, we would do dribbling drills, we do shooting drills, and we do passing drills and things like that. We're focused on fundamentals. And what's interesting is sometimes when I, we went on youth camps, you know, when I ask, hey, what was the most uh, fun activity or what did you spend most time on? You know what kids would usually always say? They would always say this. They would go, zip lining. <laughs> right? Do you guys ever go zip lining? It's actually really fun, right? And this is an observation I started to make. Like, and this would be, you know, a lot of people give their life to Christ at retreats. They get baptized, they come into the kingdom. And even though that, that happened, you know, kids are so honest, they go, zip line. <laughs> and I was like, man, I, I don't wanna be like one of those grumpy old men that just, hey, we can't go zip lining anymore. We're losing all the fundamentals. We're, 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 we gotta just be strictly like apostles teaching fellowship, break your bread and prayer. But you know what? I came with the solution. You guys wanna hear my solution? Yeah. It's called zip ties-ing. <laughs> All right, is we will we will use the zip line to baptize the children. So when they they remember, they'll be like, my favorite memory of retreat is when I got zip ties. You know, when I got zip ties into the kingdom of God. And I think you guys kind of start to get my point. You know, I've had even interviews of sometimes at churches where they go, oh, what's your experience with games? Because we need our youth group to be fun. And do you guys know the statistics of youth group? After they leave and they go to college, it's rising close to 80% of them are gonna leave their faith. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because they didn't have a strong faith to begin with. Because we created churches to be more like Chuck E. Cheese than the army of Christ. And we need to be training our next generation of these four fundamentals. Think about if a basketball team went to camp and all they did was went zip lining and all they did was just games. They'd be really good at zip lining and the games, and they're not focused. And if you're focused on the fun fundamentals, you're gonna dominate. And as a church, if we want to fight the dark forces of this world, we gotta train our children, amen, of the four fundamentals. So the devotion to the apostles' teaching and fellowship equals devotion to the breaking of bread and prayers. It's getting together and be like, hey, let's break bread together, brother. Let's talk about what the Lord has done. Let's pray together. Sister, just like a good basketball player is devoted to dribbling, passing, shooting, and playing defense, a strong member of the church is devoted to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Devotion to the four devotions. Four fundamentals is a natural outflow from a true encounter with the living God. This is what you would want to do. This is not how you get saved, but it shows that you are saved. It's kind of like a person when they first discover their love for guitar or their, their first love for the game of basketball or baseball or football. It's, that's all they want to do. 
And so when we come into a true encounter with God, these are the activities they want to do. All they want to do is study the apostles' teaching. All they want to do is be in fellowship. All they want to do is break bread and pray with their brothers and sisters. A life of true, genuine salvation produces a life of devotion to the four devotions, the four fundamentals. Martin Luther said this, we are saved by faith through grace alone, but the faith alone that saves is never alone. Doesn't that make sense? We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. There is this natural fruit that produces from a true believer. A huge part of fellowship is in the sharing of the Lord's table, the breaking of bread. Now, I don't know if you guys remember this, we were at the park and I went under a table. I, don't, I, got, I got kind of taller so I can't see a table I could go under. <laughs> But the Lord's table is also a very good reminder because when we come to the Lord's table, we're all submitting ourselves. We're all saying we're all sinners. We're all sinners and we're coming and encountering the one and only Savior. So we all come humble and we know as brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter if you're a criminal or if you're a cop. You know, if you are small or if you're tall, it doesn't matter what race you are, we're all coming together and we're all admitting, hey, we're all sinners. You know, for some weird reason, the most reaction, it's always about sports, like Niner fan, Raider fan. It doesn't matter. When we come to church, we're both sinners. Amen. We're sinners and we look to that perfect Savior. And John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, said this, although my memory is fading, I remember two things clearly that I am a great sinner, but Christ is a great Savior. Amen. We forget this, and when we forget this, we fall into sin, but when we remember, we remain in His love and we remain in His righteousness. 1 John 1 3 says, That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim. Everybody say, Proclaim! proclaim. Also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are proclaimers. Look to your neighbor and say, we are proclaimers! We are proclaimers. We are proclaimers so others can enjoy the fellowship in the church. You see that? That's cornerstone colors. Let's go. We are in the church and the triune God. The triune God, Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is the ultimate church. So I want you guys to proclaim about your church. Tell people about the cornerstone. Proclaim about the ultimate church. You could even start with that. Have you ever heard of the ultimate church? Be like, what? <laughs> Say, what? What is that? Oh, it's with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And be like, whoa. So others can have what? Fellowship. There are people lost without the fellowship of the church, and they're out of the fellowship of the ultimate church of triune God. So I want you guys to remember pig, pig, everybody say pig. I know the church loves pig, right? Like that, that pig skin, what's that called? I forgot. Oh yeah. All right, all right, ready, right here. Three point sermon real quick. Proclaim, proclaim, proclaim. All right, you guys know sermons are like three points, right? Have you guys ever noticed that? And the reason why they say that the humans, they can't remember more than three points. I went to so many chapels at my college that PJ and I went to, I only remember one sermon. And it was my friend Steve Salazar, and he said, pray, pray, pray. That's all I remember. I don't remember anything else. So I want to encourage you guys by proclaim, proclaim, proclaim. Ready? Say that with me. Proclaim, proclaim, proclaim. All right. OK, now invite, invite, invite. So not are we only proclaimers, we're inviters. We invite, invite, invite people. And then now, the third one, ready? Go, go, go! Go, go, go! Go, go, go! And that spells what? Pig. All right, I know it's super corny, but it's to help you remember. So let's be a pig. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> let's be, wait. Never mind. I gotta work on this. All right, proclaim, invite, and go, go, go. Invest in eternal Friendships. Invest in eternal friendships. The sharing of property and possessions for people in need. This is what the early church did. They are like, you know what? My property is your property. My possessions is your possessions. Fellowship is a spiritual duty of believers to encourage and challenge each other with holiness and faithfulness by inspiring each other 
in love and good works. The reason, one of the reasons why we meet at church is to inspire each other. Hey, don't give up. Don't give up on your friend you're trying to reach for Christ. You know, I know you're tired right now. Keep on serving. Keep on loving. It's so we can encourage each other for the good works of God. And that's what Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This reminded me of Galatians. I was reading Galatians last night. I just started laughing. Galatians 1 through 3. It talks about if there's a brother or there's a sister that's kind of falling away, saying go to that brother in gentleness so you don't fall into that same temptation. And then the Bible is so wise. It starts to address if you start thinking you're too important to help that person, it says, remember, you're not that important. <laughs> That's what Galatians says. And I want you guys to think about in the fellowship when there's people falling away because of sin, falling away because maybe just being lazy, not wanting to meet together. It's reaching out to that person in gentleness and patience, saying, hey, come back. Come back to the church. Come back to the family. Jesus, Jesus sharing his home, heaven with us. I don't know if you guys ever think about this, but Jesus, imagine Jesus, he looked down at us from heaven on earth, and we were homeless, we were addicted, we were, we were in sin, and we were lost. And Jesus, his attitude was, I'm going to go down and bring heaven to you and restore you to who you were supposed to be. Isn't that amazing? Jesus looked down and on us. He saw in our condition, in our sinful condition, he says, I'm going to go down to you. On earth, he starts the process of restoration, and in heaven, he will complete it. Amen. This is very important to remember. On earth, he starts the process of restoration, and in heaven, he will complete it. I don't know if you guys are like me, but so many people told me in the church, are you going to go to heaven? They would always ask that. Do you think you're going to heaven? That's actually not a biblical uh, uh, concept, to go to heaven. But actually, heaven comes to us. In Revelation 21, it says when heaven comes down to earth, we can't go to heaven. But heaven had to come to us. Heaven has to come to us. And if heaven has come to you, if Jesus has come to you, and Jesus has shared his property with you, his home, his mansion, oh. heaven, fallen, right? right? Like, you know, I remember, I always remember my seminary professor said, did you know heaven is a gated community? I was like, what? <laughs> I just always like that, like, what? What does that mean? All right, church box theory. So many times we're like, come into our box and we'll tell you about God. But Jesus didn't do that. He's like, I'm going to go to you and I'm going to build a box around you. If you want to catch fish, you have to go to the ocean. If you want to catch fish, you have to go to the ocean. And this is a word of challenge or rebuke. We are called to be fishers of men, not just keepers of the aquarium. That's why we must not only proclaim, 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 invite, 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 but we have to go, 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 let's go. And this is an example in the 70s where Pastor Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapel they started to notice what was going on in their surroundings. This was the hippie movement. So they went to the hippies at the beach. One of my favorite conferences I went to was Mark Cahill. He's an evangelist. And after he trained us how to evangelize, guess where we went? Right after it was over, we went to the beach to go evangelize. We need to create more models of churches like this. We learn something, and then we go do something for the kingdom of God. And so... This is what they did. They went to the people. They went to the people. If you want to catch fish, you have to go to the ocean. And guess what happened? All these hippies, they came into the church. And I want you guys to imagine, this church had very nice carpets. Do hippies wear shoes? No, they take off their shoes, right? I should have took off my shoes. I made it that Asian. They took off their shoes because they didn't wear shoes. They're barefoot. You guys ever become blackfoot? You know, you guys walk around your house and you're looking at oh, no, I'm blackfoot. Or you go over to your friend's house and, you know, the, you know the homie's house where everybody's always over all the time so you can't take your shoes off or your feet will turn black? All the, the hippies that came into the church, they started ruining the carpets. 
the carpets start getting all tore up and messed. And the elders, they got really upset at the pastor. And they said, Pastor, why would you invite all these hippies? They're ruining our carpets. And you know what the pastor said? He said, thank you, elders, for letting me know that. Why don't you get out as well as the carpets? <laughs> so he ripped out the carpets, and he asked them, if you care more about the carpets than those souls coming to Christ, then you don't belong here in this leadership. So he was willing to tear out the carpets for the souls of the lost that they brought in. Because, come on now, none of us are finished. All of us are dealing with something. All of us are imperfect. All of us are here dirty before the Lord. And so I want to encourage you with that example. Jesus says, come live with me in my environment. Come live with me in my property, and I'll restore you to who you're supposed to be. The cornerstone, I see you guys doing this with your generosity and your hospitality. Let's continue to bring people into the community of the Trinity for infinity. And that's what it means to fellowship. This is a beautiful painting. This was painted in the Dominican Republic. And it's this constant reminder that God pours into us and that we pour into others. That our relationship with God, God pours into us and we pour into others. And going even deeper, we need a good amount of spiritual mentors in our life. And we need good brothers and sisters in our life so we could pour into the next generation. I just want to pause. The sermon's not over, right? Thank you, uh, Cornerstone, for this fellowship community, for being a reflection of the unity within diversity. Every time my wife Deborah and I comes here, we feel like family, just like Gail said. You're family, and you, we feel like we're part of the Cornerstone family. Breaking of bread. And so this picture was definitely taken before COVID. <laughs> Eating together, right? <laughs> Eating together is so, so important. I remember a comedian said, I'd rather eat soup with someone I love than to eat steak with someone I hate, all right? And then I told that to my youth kids, and she's like, just give me the steak, I'll eat by myself, <laughs> all right? <laughs> but eating together is so important, and communion together, having larger uh, fellowship meals, amen? Just like we did at the park in the Pines not too long ago. The Lord's Supper and communion together is very important. And one simple challenge I want you guys to think about is having communion in your homes. Look to your neighbor and say, let's have communion in our homes. <laughs> Especially if you are the father, if you're the man of the house, I want to encourage you to lead your family into the breaking of bread in your home. And just once in a while say, hey, we're going to get together with this grape juice and this bread and remember and remember the Lord, right? Because I don't know if you guys drink wine or anything. Why, why do we do communion, more importantly? There are three reasons I want to share with you why. This is in Matthew 26, verses 26 to 28. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, it broke and, and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So again, that word, proclaim. So there is forgiveness of sins and proclaim. 1 Corinthians 10, 17, the Apostle Paul writes, Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So why are we doing communion? Three reasons. Forgiveness of sins, proclaiming the gospel, and to remind ourselves we are one. We are what? One. In Christ. So forgiveness of sins, proclaiming the gospel, and we are one in Christ. And another thing, I want to encourage you guys and challenge you even further, not only doing communion once in a while in your home, but taking communion to a believer's house. Isn't that cool? When you go over to your friend's house, take the elements. Take bread, take some grape juice, yeah. and go 
and break bread. Be like, hey, brother, hey, sister, I haven't seen you for a while. And you could even give it to them. Since you're the man of the house, why don't you lead us in communion? Just to be reminded, just to be reminded of the forgiveness of sins, proclaiming the gospel, and that we are one in Christ. And I want to share with you a great example. This is a familiar guy, right? <laughs> Pastor Paul, PJ. And I don't know how many years ago now. I'm really bad with, like, time. But not too long ago. Seems like it was yesterday. But PJ, he's like, hey, bro, let's go to Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> Are you guys big uh, chicken wing fans? <laughs> and then he buys me Buffalo Wild Wings, right? <laughs> and I'm like, dude, this guy's the best. Um, and then not only that, he gives me a book. He's like, this book, it really influenced me um, in biblical praise and worship. I want you to have it. So what a great example of a leader. Amen? Amen. What a guy you have as your leader of the Cornerstone Church. Not only does he buy me chicken wings to feed my stomach, but he gives me this book to feed the soul. And this is a very simple thing that we could act out for our little homies, our little brothers and little sisters. Not those little homie gangster toys. I mean like little brothers and little sisters to go to them and feed their stomach and to feed their soul, to partake in his fellowship. And I remember this, PJ, it's so simple, but he says, it's important that we do this, brother. And I was like, hey, man, come on, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> all right, because of what Jesus, all right, this is important, all right? It's important that we do this, and amen. All right, because of what Jesus has done with his life, death, and resurrection, we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. So I want you guys to remember just the analogy. If you want to be great at basketball or great at anything, you have to know the four fundamentals. And if this church, we want to be a great church for Christ, we have to be people who remember. We have to be people who remember that we are saved by grace through faith alone. But a natural outflow is devotion to the apostles' teaching, is devotion to fellowship, it's devotion to breaking of bread and a devotion to prayer. And thank you guys again for being a beautiful church. And let me close this in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this church. Thank you for the cornerstone that they are devoted to the apostles' teaching. They're devoted to your teaching. And God, thank you for this beautiful fellowship, this fellowship of family, a fellowship who shares, a fellowship who has things in common, a fellowship that participates in your ministry of preaching, teaching, and healing. God, we thank you for this church that we get to break bread together and remember you. And to remember that your body was broken so we could come together. And that your blood was shed so our sin, even though it was like scarlet, you washed us white as snow. And thank you for the beautiful gift of prayer. May we continue to flourish as a church, a church founded by the gospel and a church that naturally overflows the four devotions of your teaching, a fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.